welcome everyone. In this slideshow I'll be showing you how I repainted the chassis frame on my 1949 AC. It did not require any repairs as it is built like a bridge girder. No need for any crumple zones either as it makes use of other people's crumple zones which is very obliging of them. There were a couple of tiny areas of rust pitting where the plywood boot side panels bolt against it. As it would have created a water trap, I filled it with epoxy metal filler after suitable surface preparation. I'll be talking about choosing the right types of paint as well as applying it and also the surface prep. The, the chassis was originally coated with bitumen and nothing else. I'm not sure if that was due to post-war shortages or simply the lack of paint types available. Today we have a bewildering choice but confusion tends to be added by makers and retailers who promote the alleged attributes of each paint. If you want to find good articles and advice, business to business websites are the best because they give no nonsense info without the sales spin. My ac2liter.com website has an article on paint types within the section on restoration. For this video I'll just mention some important key points. Most protective paint systems will consist of two or more coats of primer paint followed by two or more coats of glossy top coat. Primer is needed because it sticks better to the, to the bare metal. Most primers are porous so you need the top coats to keep out the moisture and provide protection against stone chips and abrasion. Some articles I used to read talked about undercoats between primer and top coat. Undercoats are needed for colour matching for decorative paint so you only need to consider it if the chassis is exposed for everyone to admire. The first problem is which types of primer and top coat to use. A lot of discussion dwells on the rust preventative qualities of some primers. What we should be discussing is making sure the primer sticks firmly and uniformly to the metal with no voids to trap air or moisture. If the paint doesn't stick then its other qualities become irrelevant. I used to hear a lot of talk about the zinc primers, the implication usually being that it will almost be like galvanising with a, a zinc layer. There are various types of primer with the word zinc in their description but they don't necessarily contain any metallic zinc. One of these is zinc chromate which was used for priming aluminium especially aircraft. Another one is zinc phosphate primer which also has nothing to do with galvanising. Zinc phosphate itself is useful as part of pre-paint prep chemical which I'll mention later. Finally there is zinc rich primer which really does contain zinc particles. It usually comes in a, an epoxy based paint. I considered using this at first but there are a few major problems for DIY users working at home. If it is to give galvanising protection those zinc flakes in the paint need to make good electrical contact with the chassis surface. That means blast cleaning the chassis. Secondly, you can't give the chassis that phosphating pre-paint treatment because part of its benefit is to render the surface metal non-conducting. This helps to stop fresh rust from forming, but it also hinders the use of zinc-rich primer. Thirdly, applying this primer by brush causes problems because of the way the heavy pigment settles unless you know the special brushing technique. Although I ditched the idea of zinc-rich primer, I stuck with epoxy. It's known as epoxy mastic, presumably because it is designed to stick well. It has low surface tension and tends to get into the small pits on the metal surface. The epoxy is also one of the few primers that is waterproof, meaning it can be used without top coats if you wish. It is also compatible with most types of paint. I decided to use two part polyurethane as a top coat as I know how tough that paint is from when I painted the concrete garage floor. This two part top coat requires a two part primer, so the epoxy is the ideal partner. One drawback of the epoxy mastic is that its appearance will deteriorate when exposed to, to sunlight. That's fine for some applications such as hidden brackets or the top of the chassis rails. I order this paint in black so it can be used on its own. The surface finish is satin rather than gloss. Initially I tried a two part polyurethane by the marine, make, marine paint maker International. Known as International Perfection it is ridiculously expensive but sometimes you get what you pay for. 
This paint levels like coach paint for a beautiful glossy finish. However, I switched to Jotun paints for both epoxy and polyurethane. The latter was marketed as ideal for steel structures, remembering that there are many different types of polyurethane paint. Unfortunately, you could only buy larger tins of this, about 5 litres for each. Note that the hardener for the polyurethane goes off after a few months, at least once opened, so you need to be ready to do a lot of painting to use it up. The surface finish of the Jotun top coats was terrible. Fortunately this doesn't matter for most of the chassis, as I'm not making it a show car. The retailer produced their own thinner, which improves matters a little. When I later painted the floor panel for the spare wheel locker, I abraded the paint with wet and dry, going down to an ultra-fine 2000 grit, and then used a cutting polish. This provided a satisfactory gloss, although not to coach painting standards. Alternatives to this paint system include the American POR15. I haven't tried it, but it has a reputation for being extremely tough, so much so that you have to be careful not to get it into, into screw threads. One drawback is that it is not compatible with other paints, although you can apply barrier coats. Preparation is crucial when painting metal. Before doing any sanding or wire brushing, it is best to decrease the surface, otherwise the any oil and grease will get ground into the pores in the metal. I use POR15's cleaner degreaser. I'm not a big fan of using wire brushes prior to painting. If you're using a wire brush in, a, in an electric drill, please wear goggles as broken wires will fly off. If you wire brush over ru a rusty surface, it can sometimes create a glazed over surface that looks similar to bare steel, but slightly darker. In fact, it is hiding rust, as you'll discover if you rub it with emery cloth. Even if all the rust has been removed, wire brushing leaves a glossy surface that paint will struggle to adhere to. You can correct that by following up with abrasives. Wire brushes are useful for rust, rough cast surfaces or weld joints. At first I used the cleaner degreaser for the final clean-up, but when I overhauled the rear axle I crack tested parts of it and the crap test kit included an effective solvent cleaner. I found that using that solvent as well made the paint stick more effectively. You still need a final clean to remove any traces of solvent. The last stage of preparation is the phosphating treatment. Again I used POR15's version, metal prep. The purpose of this treatment is partly to treat the final traces of rust, it also acid etches the metal surface to create a matte finish instead of a slippery gloss surface and it also makes a non-conducting surface to help prevent fresh rust from forming. I wear goggles and rubber gloves while I apply it with an old paintbrush. I leave it on for at least 20 minutes by which time the surface turns purple or blue with some white powder lying around. I then rinse it with water, ideally deionized water. Then wipe it dry with kitchen paper and leave it to dry leave it to dry further in the sunshine if possible. Otherwise I use a hairdryer. Avoid touching the surface. I mix together the epoxy mastic in a paint kettle or suitable plastic tub and brush it on. One coat per day. I usually gave three coats, then three coats of the two part polyurethane. The level of fumes from the epoxy are very low. However, the polyurethane is pretty awful and I paint it outside if possible. Parts of the AC chassis are boxed in, but fortunately some of these have access holes. To clean the inside I initially tried a wire brush on a flexible wire, although it kept breaking. I stuck some emery cloth to some suitable sticks to reach inside. I also bought paint brushes with a 45 degree bend and long handles. 
For good measure, I also got myself a cheap boroscope that works with my laptop computer. Here are some views inside the side rails at the rear of the car. These were taken after phosphating the surface. The rear cross member was more awkward. It has two access holes underneath, one at each end, but I couldn't get any tools inside. I sprayed the inside with Dynatrol. I also sprayed inside all the other box sections after painting. Here's the view in, in the side rails alongside the rear seat. I painted the chassis one small region at a time. If you were to try and paint the entire chassis with brushes, it would take about six hours to apply just one coat. There is a lot of fine detail and you need various sizes of brush. I painted the rear of the chassis while the bodywork was dismantled and the top surface during the brief period that the body was lifted. The jacking points needed to be painted body colour so I used the epoxy, sanded it flat and applied grey undercoat and green coat paint. Note that if you do sand epoxy you need to let it cure for at least a week otherwise the dust poses a health risk. I also wanted a nice glossy finish around the engine bay and applied black coach paint. With hindsight it might have been better to buy some of that expensive International Perfection two part top coat to make it more durable. I also painted the brake cross shaft and brackets. There's the subframe for the rear dampers. Here I'm sanding the inside with abrasives stuck to a copper tube. I was still using the international paint on this and you can see the nice finish on the tube. The brackets reinforcing the B pillars I painted with epoxy only as I didn't want the paint thickness to create a tight fit and the rear axle hasps. I cut out rubber axle stops. Originally they were riveted on but it was easier to drive screws into the rubber. Lots of other brackets. The sling for the bell housing. More recently I switched to a British brand of epoxy mastic, Built Hamber. They supply it in handy small quantities which I have used on engine parts. I noticed that Joton listed their epoxy as suitable for aluminium so I experimented. After hardening for 9 months I attacked it with a screwdriver and could only scratch the glossy surface. Perfect for under the wings. But that takes us into the next chapter, completing the bodywork. I've survived to fight another day on this epic project, so next time I'll conclude the body panel work. Thanks for watching.